Hi, my name is Steve Meeker, and I'm going to tell you a story that you might find hard to believe, but I'm telling you that it is a true story that I um, was there to experience it firsthand. Uh, most of it takes place in my hometown, which was Kerrville, Texas, and many, many years ago. Um, in, uh, in 1975, in fact, in the spring of that year, there was a Baptist minister from Dallas named Ray Valance. He had actually gone to preach a revival in a small town uh, near Lufkin, Texas, in East Texas. And he was very hungry for God, really hungry for a move of God in his life. So one morning he went out by himself into the woods near Lufkin, and just praying very fervently. And suddenly he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and even had uh, a message uh, of speaking in tongues uh, as evidence. Uh, he wasn't even asking for that in particular, but it was a very powerful move that came on him and he was thrilled. Um, when he came back to Dallas, his church wasn't too thrilled though with that idea and they actually dismissed him. And so during the summer of 75, he came to my hometown, Kerrville, and he took over a small little church, of about 50 people, um, that was just kind of struggling. And uh, he became the pastor there. I think some friends of his from Dallas had come and were a part of that church. Well, things got really rough for him a couple of months after he moved to Kerrville. Uh, his teenage daughter, 16-year-old girl named Beth, and one of her best friends, they disappeared. And nobody knew what had happened to them. They, uh, uh, they just disappeared one night and um, uh, for weeks and months went by and nobody knew exactly what had happened. People reported seeing her various places, but those reports always ended up dead ends. Well, in the meantime, um, in the fall of 1975, I started my senior year of high school, and my best friend was a tall, slender fellow named Randy Honeycutt. And Randy had met a girl that he liked. Her name was Debbie, and Debbie attended Brother Ray's church. And Debbie told Randy that if he wanted to hang out with her, that he was going to have to go to church with her. And so he did. And we don't, I don't normally recommend what we called in college uh, missionary dating, but in this case, it worked out pretty well because Randy got saved and he, um, uh, he started talking to me about coming to see this church. And he said, you really got to come see this preacher. He's crazy. Now, in our uh, teenage vernacular, crazy meant good. It meant he was different. Uh, he was uh, funny. He was expressive. And so I went one night, I think it was around November of 1975. I went to an evening service and it was the first time I'd ever been in a service where people were real expressive with their worship, where they were raising their hands and praise God out loud. I was raised in a Methodist church. That wasn't the experience that I had there. And so um, it was new to me and I thought it was interesting, a little bit uncomfortable. And so I didn't go back again for a while. But I remember at the time uh, when they would be having services and I would be at my house, I would be thinking, I wonder what they're doing out there. They've got a connection to something that I don't have. And so after a couple of months, I started going back uh, with my friend Randy and um, uh, and uh, about a month, I guess I, I think I can even tell you the date, March the 7th of 1976 was when I, I actually gave my, my life to the Lord uh, at a little altar there in that church. The church was called Midway Baptist Church, but it wasn't really affiliated with any other group. It was a, an independent church. Um, so I got to know the pastor really well. Of course, the, the backdrop of all this was in the background, the keeping hearing about his daughter Beth was missing and everybody was praying for her to uh, you know, have a safe return. Um, so the rest of that school year went on and I graduated in May of 76. And then that summer I was preparing to go to college in Huntsville at Sam Houston State University. And in August, right before I was getting ready to leave, uh, there was a report came that Beth had been found, uh, Beth and her friend. Uh, but unfortunately, they had been found dead. They were both had been actually raped and murdered uh, some 11 months before, and their bodies had been left in a field outside of Kerrville. 
Uh, and um, of course, it was a, a very difficult time. I remember going to the memorial service. Brother Ray tried to preach the memorial service for her himself. He was so overcome with grief that he actually passed out right before the service. Uh, but he did manage to do it. Uh, I learned an awful lot as a young Christian by watching uh, my pastor, Brother Ray, as we called him, and his wife, Sister Pat, uh, as they dealt with that horrible situation of their daughter being murdered. The um, trial was moved to Fort Stockton, Texas. There, there were two men that were arrested uh, for the rape and murder of both of the, both of the girls. And um, Brother Ray told me later on that during the trial, he actually had the idea that he could slip a pistol in his pocket and walk in and shoot both of them. Nobody would have stopped in those days. They didn't have metal detectors or anything like that. Uh, but instead, the Holy Spirit had his way with Brother Ray, and he walked up to them at the end of the trial, handed them both Bibles. He said, I forgive you, and I want you to know my Jesus. It was a pretty powerful time, a very powerful uh, impression that it made on me as a young Christian. So even though I was in college, I was always checking back. And when I came home for breaks from college, I was always happy to see Brother Ray and uh, uh, Sister Pat and catch up and see how they were doing. So I finished my first year of college uh, in 1977, and I came home that year. Now, my friend Randy that I mentioned earlier, he was a year behind me in high school, so he graduated in May of 77. I remember going to his graduation ceremony. And um, he took a job in Kerrville working for the Cablevision company. And about a month after he graduated, right around the end of June, he uh, was showing somebody that he had learned how to climb a utility pole using the little metal spikes that you strap around your ankles. And so as he was doing that, well, he got in contact with a high voltage power line and he was killed. It was a very difficult time for me, my best friend. It was a big part of my life was wrapped up in him. We'd been in school together for many years and uh, knew each other, knew what each other were thinking. And so it was like uh, a big part of me was gone. But I do know God gave me a good deal of peace and comfort um, during that time. But it was still a difficult time. Um, so I went back to college that next fall I was involved with uh, the Assembly of God Church in Huntsville, uh, Brother Barnes Church, and uh, also was involved in the beginnings of the Chi Alpha ministry that uh, was developed there. And uh, by the end of my second year, some of my friends in Huntsville had said, hey, you know, we have a summer camp back in your hometown of Kerrville. You should be a camp counselor. And I thought, okay, I'll do that. So this was the summer of 1978. And I think there were two different weeks of youth camp. They'd have a different group of kids each week coming, uh, teenagers, you know. And then later, there were two different weeks of kids camp, you know, kids that were anywhere from 7 to 11 years old. And uh, I'll never forget the second week of the kids camp. They put me in charge of a group of 7, or eight year, seven and 8-year-old boys. I think I had about a dozen of them. I'm 20 years old in charge of these uh, dozen seven and eight year old boys. And I'm not sure who thought that was a good idea, but nevertheless, that's the way it was. And I'll never forget on the first night of this, uh, this week of kids camp, one of the little boys was homesick. He was crying. He was about eight years old. His name was Billy and he was from the Houston area somewhere. I don't know exactly where. And um, I buddied up to him. And I said, oh, Billy, we're going to have a good time this week. We're going to play baseball. We're going to you know, have all kinds of games and crafts. And we're going to do all kinds of fun things. And it's going to be great. And I said, here, I'll put your bunk right over here next to mine. The uh, bunks were in this little um, cabin. Uh, they kind of were like shelves along the side, a lower one and an upper one. And so I put uh, his pillow right next to my pillow. His body was one direction. Mine was the other one. But our heads were right you know, by each other. I said, you can be right over here by me, and we're going to have a great time this week. So then the next day, I kind of was looking after Billy and just making sure that he was doing okay, and he seemed to be doing all right. That night, the, uh, the second night of camp, there was a service for the kids, and there was a really powerful move of the Holy Spirit there. 
So much so that um, well, some kids were actually falling out in the spirit. Now, that is a real experience. Um, I know that somehow uh, it's sort of fallen out of uh, uh, use or fallen out of it, that experience that so you don't see it as much now as you used to. I think maybe it got faked in the televangelist movement. That's just my opinion. But nevertheless, it's a real thing. It has happened to me, and it's a great experience. You know, just a powerful, loving presence of God. So several kids were, you know, kind of laying on the floor out in the spirit during the service. And then the service ended, and I needed to get back to the cabin to get the boys ready for, you know, the lights out. And so uh, I'm doing that, and uh, a couple of the other little boys bring Billy in kind of on their shoulders. They're sort of carrying him, you know, one on either side of him. He's walking, but he's really still out in the spirit. And so we put him on his bed, and I get all the other boys uh, together uh, to, you know, get their stuff ready for lights out and get in bed and everything and turn out the lights and then I get in bed and I can hear Billy though is because his pillow is right next to mine I can hear him kind of mumbling at first and uh, you know by just making some little noises and this went on for about 20 minutes after we turned out the lights and then um, he um, he woke up or came to and he said where am I and I said you're at camp and then I said where have you been and he said, I've been in heaven. And I said, oh, really? Tell me about it. And he proceeded to tell me a lot of things that I know to be true from the scriptures about heaven that I don't know that an eight-year-old boy would know. He told me the colors were brilliant. He said you couldn't, couldn't believe how beautiful the colors were. He said the streets of gold you can see right through. Well, I've read later in Revelation that it does say that the streets of gold are actually transparent. I've read that gold in its purest form is is actually transparent. And then he said he saw Jesus. He said Jesus was beautiful. Jesus was explaining things to him. And um, so he was telling me quite a bit. I don't remember many of the details of what he was uh, telling me about uh, Jesus talking to him until he said, so I asked Jesus about you, about me. And I said, well, what did Jesus say about me? And he said, Jesus said that Steve is a good Christian and he'll probably make it to heaven. And that probably has kept me on the straight and narrow many times uh, over the past years. But uh, I thought that was an interesting uh, event. But then it got really interesting because he said, when I mentioned your name, this tall, slender fellow came up and he said, did you say Steve? He was my best friend when I was on the earth. And he described my friend Randy perfectly to him, his appearance perfectly, and I believe he used his name, and I was just blown away. I couldn't believe that this boy had seen my best friend who had died the year before in heaven and come back to tell me about it. Really a powerful time. I was just laying in the bed with my hands straight up, you know, when he heard that, when I heard that. Uh, and then Billy proceeded to tell me about other people that he met. He listed several names and then he said, and I met a girl named Beth who was telling me what a good man her father was. And I said, can you describe her for me? Well, he described my pastor's daughter. I had not never met her, but I'd seen pictures of her and the description he gave fit her with the name Beth, telling about what a good man her father was. Well, as you can imagine, I can, um, I couldn't wait until that week was over to tell Randy's family and to tell Brother Ray and Sister Pat that this little boy had seen uh, Randy and Beth in heaven. Now, I've been angry with myself for the time because I never got the boy's last name. I was 20 years old. I wasn't uh, always snapping to details. It might have been Smith. I don't know. Um, I just remember he was from the Houston area and I'd never met him before. He didn't know me. He didn't know any of the people that I'm describing to you, but he saw them in heaven and he came back and told me about it. And so that's why I'm telling you this story now. You'll never convince me that there's not a loving God, that Jesus isn't real, and that heaven is a powerful, beautiful place. Thank you for listening to my story. Again, I'm Steve Meeker. I'll kind of be like John in Revelation. 
I am the one who saw this happen and was reported to me firsthand. Thank you.